One in three women and one in four men have experienced some kind of physical violence from a partner. That, according to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Urban Resource Institute is the largest domestic violence shelter service in the country. It focuses on gender-based violence and homelessness and is New York City's only co-living program for survivors and pets. With us today is URI's Deputy Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Carla Smith, along with Hope Dawson Sessoms. Survivors, she is a survivor, I should say, of domestic violence. Thank you both for being with us this afternoon and welcome back to you. Thank you for having us. You know, I'd like to think that uh, things have gotten better when it comes to organizations like yours. However, when you consider where we are as a nation, um, all of the financial pressures, the other issues we're having, I suspect that is not the case. Actually, we're still seeing increasing numbers, right? Um, the New York City Police Department actually responded to over 240,000 domestic violence incident calls uh, in 2022. We're seeing increasing fatality rates uh, throughout the city with the Bronx and Brooklyn um, experiencing high rates of domestic violence fatalities. 2022 is online to actually be the highest, one of the highest rated fatality rates in the last decade that we've seen. So while organizations like Urban Research mm -hmm. Institute is working to change that narrative by providing services and working with survivors like Hope, we really understand that there's a need for our services, right? There's a need for us to continue to do this work, to partner with other organizations, and to have our clients at the center of everything that we're doing. Why do, you, why are we seeing this? You know, there's been so much education on this issue. Mm -hmm. um, so many people willing to help. Um, why do you think the numbers keep going up? Right. Well, remember, we just came out of a pandemic, mm -hmm. right? And so while the numbers were still increasing then, we understood that people were really having their, their ability to talk about the violence that might have been happening in the home was impacted, right? They were sheltering in place, sometimes in partnership with the person who was causing harm. Mm -hmm. There are a number of reasons why you know, people commit harm against another person. We work with abusive partners and are really learning from them around the issues that they are sort of dealing with, not as an excuse, right? Mm -hmm. Really trying to hold them accountable. But we understand that we have to continue to do this work to make sure that we're getting the word out, that people know that their services are available to them, that they can reach out for support in a safe and confidential manner, and that there's hope on the other side, right? Hope yeah. is, is here, <laughs> but there's hope on the other side, right? And, and hope is is, is really evidence of what can happen when you get access to that support. Yeah, Hope, and I want to bring you into the conversation because I, I understand that you're kind of an ex-client mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, of URIs. Talk to me a, a little bit about what happened that, that made you seek the services. Yes, yes, so I am a former resident of URI, and I think, just not to backtrack, but mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I believe that we're seeing a tick and there will probably continue to be one is because a lot of times when we talk about domestic violence we talk about the hospital bed we talk about when it's very extreme mm -hmm. and so a lot of times people don't even recognize that they're in a violent situation until it's at that point mm -hmm. where your life is you know threatened but not realizing that raising your voice you know controlling behavior controlling the finances. There are so many different um, red flags, if you would, yeah. that if we start to destigmatize the conversation around domestic violence and what that looks like, and we actually address all of the unhealthy interactions we have, then um, we can see more people get help mm -hmm. sooner. Uh, so for myself, I was in a tumultuous situation, a relationship that I didn't see as being you know, bad. I thought, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I'm just, you know, uh, very desired, if you would. <laughs> yeah, you thought uh, it was some form of, uh, of It was of flattering at first, mm -hmm. right? It was flattering mm -hmm. at first to be jealous or controlling and these things. And then when it got to a certain point, I was noticing that I couldn't make excuses for certain behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't able to stay in my home anymore and my life was threatened and these, you know, things occurred. And so in that I found myself relocating to New York thinking mm -hmm. that I had enough saved up that I could just get me an apartment yeah. and that did not happen. Mm. So I found myself going to PATH through the PATH program. Um, in that 
I didn't even classify myself as a domestic violence survivor mm -hmm. because I still was like, I didn't end up in the hospital. Yeah, it, it didn't get so bad. So yeah. why would I consider yeah. myself Of that? course he threatened my life, but you know, I wasn't hospitalized, so mm -hmm. I don't classify as such. Yeah. But everyone that I told my story to, you know, they classified me as DV two and one because mm -hmm. I had two children and was one adult. Yeah. Um, and we had Coco, our dog. Yeah. So through the Mayor's Alliance, um, I was told about Urban Resource Institute, which I was shocked that it even existed, but she told me not to get my hopes up, right, because they may not have space for me. there's such a need. Yes, mm -hmm. they had a space come available that was perfect for me, and um, the rest is kind of history. It was, yeah. it was uh, something I didn't even find imaginable, yet, you know, obtainable. So it was great. You said a, a mouthful here. Yes. <laughs> so there's a, I'm going to turn to the expert yes. again. One of the things that she said um, about the fact of not recognizing, mm -hmm. not even acknowledging, and you talked about stigma. Mm -hmm. Is that still a, a, an issue that people i don't know and i you know a lot a lot of the people that need the help are women the, mm -hmm. the vast majority mm -hmm. are they just too embarrassed um too uneducated uh, about um how you should be treated how you should be spoken to mm -hmm. um so that they just don't want to be part of that they don't want anybody saying oh she was a victim of domestic violence as if they have something to feel you know embarrassed or guilty about i think fear is at the center fear. right we talk about fear and sort of not necessarily knowing that there are resources available, but also really understanding that domestic violence is an intergenerational issue, mm -hmm. right? So many of us um, have grown up uh, surrounded by people who are in relationships where the domestic violence exists, and it's what we've learned, right? Mm -hmm. So it's hard to see anything different when you transition into adulthood. Part of our work at Urban Resource Institute is really working with kids too, right? Yeah. Making sure that we educate middle school and high school kids, understanding that domestic violence relationships start early, right? And, and t between 12 and 18, you're Old, we're starting to see some of those things and sometimes even earlier for children who's ex experienced trauma mm -hmm. right and so making sure we are addressing those issues early and then offering opportunities through creating visibility opportunities like this and media and various educational opportunities for people to be able to reach out to yeah. know That's where they can get support and this is where you are right we grow up in a culture in some cases where this is part of our culture mm -hmm. and so it's helping to change that narrative and the other thing you mentioned that I know is really important and we've had you talk about it before uh, is one of the things that makes your program so successful and so desirable to people that need the help it's the pal program that you can bring your pets and and they're gonna be welcomed with you because a lot of people I, I'm always shocked that people will say they can't get out because they can't they don't have anywhere to take their animal with them yeah I mean we recognize from the research that almost 50 percent of victims of domestic violence will not leave their abusive relationship if they have to leave their pet behind, right? I'm a pet owner. I'm not going mm -hmm. anywhere without my pet. Hope didn't want to go anywhere without her pet. And so making sure that as an organization, we can help to reduce those barriers. This is some of the work that our CEO, Mr. Fields, had actually uh, looked at in 2013 as an opportunity for us to explore. We partnered with the city. We're an experienced housing provider. We're not mm -hmm. animal welfare providers, so we yeah. really needed to partner with animal welfare providers to develop a program that allowed people to actually make a different choice, right? Mm -hmm. If I have the choice to come into safety and not leave my children behind, because pets are part of our family, family. they're our kids, yeah. and we want a space to go to so we can heal together. So we've worked really hard to create those transformational spaces for clients to come into, that they can bring their pet, that they can bring their children. And on the other side of that door, when they walk through that door, they see their animals and their animals are being taken care of too, right? And, and they can all heal together. So we're so proud of being able to do this. We've been expanding this over the years. We have another program that's opening up very soon. Transitional Shelter will be accepting pets into that shelter, mm -hmm. really opening the door for others to need those services. And, and Hope, I know that your story, one of the things that you do um, in a sense to pay it forward, and I have to believe it's cathartic for you, is that you share your story with other women. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yes, so I realized when I was getting ready to transition out of um, 
Urban Resource Institute, there was actually some of the staff who asked me, have you considered speaking? And I thought, I don't do that. That's not my thing, you know? <laughs> yes, you do. Mm -hmm. I can tell you in the few minutes before this interview started, yes, you do. Well, I mean, they, honestly, they saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, you know? Yeah. In those moments, when you think about losing everything, mm -hmm. you lose your sight of yourself in some regards also, because it's like, who am I that this is now my life, you know? And so when they told me about it, it was a seed that was planted. Mm -hmm. It never left my mind. And so they had an event that was coming up and I got an invitation to speak and I said, you know what? I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I got up, I actually met a part of myself that I didn't know existed. And it was one of the most beautiful exchanges I've had internally. And it also helped me to heal the more I talked about it. Mm -hmm. And so as I was healing through sharing my story, I wanted to empower other people, women, men, whoever experiences, mm -hmm. you know, violent or maybe even not domestic violence, but other traumas, you mm -hmm. know, I wanted to help them to see that through sharing, it's, it doesn't make you weak, it doesn't make you vulnerable, it actually empowers you and it helps you to empower somebody else. And so that's why I use my voice wherever I can um, to help. Yeah. I want to ask you about your children. Yes. Um, do you see uh, how they may have been impacted by this situation and, mm -hmm. and how have you dealt with that and, mm -hmm. and has uh, URI helped you in that regard? Yes, that is the hardest part. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it was difficult. Yeah. But knowing that I had essentially let the boogeyman in to haunt my children and their dreams and their future, that was the most difficult thing to accept. Right. Um, and so when we went to URI, they did have resources available to where they could have um, uh, counselors and, you know, people who would address their issues at their age and address my, you know, issues at my age and address Coco's issues at her age. <laughs> um, but all of us, you know, had um, some help, but also seeing what was modeled around us, we were able to come into our home and we were able to communicate more freely about what we were feeling mm -hmm. um, in that moment. And in a sense, we all left out of there. Yeah, we still had the bruise, you know, like you have a scar, it mm -hmm. hurts, it bleeds and all these things. And then it turns into a bruise. You don't feel it anymore, but it's still there. There was some residue, yeah. right? But we had been able to navigate it more healthily because we were in a place that was so peaceful, that mm -hmm. was so comfortable, that was so much like home. It didn't, um, we were talking about how beautiful the spaces are, right? Automatically, there's a measure of shame and your head hanging low when you think you're gonna have to go into the sheltering system. When you go into a URI facility, you're like, wait a minute, this is peaceful. This mm -hmm. is home. Like, I don't have to lose my dignity is the yeah, word that was yeah. used because earlier. Because I needed help. Because now I need help. Mm -hmm. So automatically your positioning is like, okay, well now I'm here. This is my home for now. I'm in a place that's peaceful. Now I can excel. Yeah. Now I can identify. Now I can heal. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were all able to do. And like I said, there's still residue, but you just continue the conversation. Yeah. It has to make you feel good to hear her say that. And I want to ask you, because um, I don't know that I've spoken with you guys about this before. You're dealing with the victims of domestic violence, but you also have a program where you deal with the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so we really believe that um, in order to end domestic violence, we have to work with people who cause harm, right? We also recognize that the majority of people in our shelters are children, right? And if you do not intervene and provide some level of support, like Hope is talking about with her kids, you could end up in a situation where your kids will go on to become victims in the future or to become individuals who cause others harm, right? And so we also believe that everyone is capable of healing and changing. And so while controversial in the past, um, we believe we have to work with people who cause harm um, and to deal with some of the underlying issues that they may have experienced in their lives. Mm -hmm. About 85% of the people who participate in our programming, both mandated and non-mandated, um, have experienced trauma and violence in their life. Some of them have witnessed domestic violence. And so as we talked about before, sometimes you go on to do what you've learned, right? Mm -hmm. And this is not an excuse for behavior. It's definitely an accountability program. 
We have programs in Manhattan and Westchester where we're serving many people who are mandated to participate by the court system and others who are volunteering to participate because they want to change their behavior, right? And so it's really working to engage in behavior change, helping them to understand what they're doing, mm -hmm. um, why they might be doing it, and to not harm someone in, in the future. Yeah. The program has had tremendous success in a short time frame, so we're really excited about it. We want to be able to continue providing those services and need support to do that. Can I ask you, um, is there a cost for the services that you provide? How, how are you funded? Yeah, I mean, in Manhattan, the program was funded by the uh, Manhattan DA's office mm -hmm. for our um, mandated program and on the... Uh, but all of your program, not just that one, but yeah. all of this. Well, we're largely government funded okay. and we do some private fundraising. Of course, we need additional resources. There is not a single government contract that covers the cost of providing services, right? And so we do appreciate our government partners for support, but we have to raise private dollars to be able to do innovative programs like PALS, mm -hmm. like our abusive partner intervention program, like our economic empowerment program. We really need to access additional resources to deliver these services, which are vital to achieving safety and stability. And so that fundraising is really important. All right. URINYC.org, that's your website. We can find out about all the wonderful programming because you guys, you come at this issue from every angle. And I want to remind people that there's the NYC 24-hour domestic violence hotline. And that hotline number, 800-621-4673. And there's also the national domestic violence hotline, 800-799-7233. Again, URINYC.org. Thank you both for being with us this afternoon. Hope. What a pleasure. I, I, I know you. she's on her game. <laughs> you are truly a remarkable young woman. Thank you. And you have a story to tell, and you should keep yelling it from the rafters. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank Both you. of you for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you.